Welcome to Pirate TV. So today we're going to be talking with uh, John Mark Dugan, who is an American expatriate independent investigative journalist living in Russia and reporting on the Donbass. We're going to play this interview that uh, he did with uh, a uh, Russian um, anti-war protester who he took to the Dunbass and um, watched her transformation. So, well, I first want to say welcome to Pirate TV. No, oh, thank you. I wanted to ask you how you ended up in Russia. Uh, you're from Seattle, or uh, did you say? <clears throat> no, no. Um, I have <laughs> I have some strange ties to Seattle. Um, I was a, a deputy sheriff uh, it, for the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. And I started blowing the whistle on corruption there. And um, when I started doing that, the law enforcement community started targeting me. And ultimately, I ended up resigning from law enforcement. I, um, After that, I started uh, whistleblower websites all over the country, including one in Renton, Washington, called um, Renton Talk, which uh, really got a lot of people angry in Renton. So that's my ties to uh, that's my ties to the Seattle area. Um, and uh, you know, I was investigated after I started these whistleblower websites, and and all they were is they were sites that gave anonymous people absolutely freedom to post about corruption in their departments, and they posted a lot. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, so it gave them anonymity and, um, the, basically the government didn't like it. So the local departments from all over the country. So in California, in, uh, Renton, in Palm Beach County and some others that I had, they got together with the FBI <clears throat> and they were investigating me for years because of these sites. And ultimately, um, uh, ultimately, the FBI came on some false pretenses and raided my home. Um, because what I did is <laughs> I made 19 recordings of dirty cops. And in Florida... You're not allowed to record people without their permission. So that's one crime that they legitimately had me on. Um, and because of these 19 recordings were posted online, they wanted the evidence that I did it. They had no probable cause to come in and get my computer, so they made up some fake uh, charges uh, rel relating to some other incident. They basically stated that I was a hacker. Um, and they entered my home, 45 FBI agents and uh, local um, local agents seized everything electronic. And uh, I knew that I was basically on the chopping block because I was facing 95 years in prison for these recordings. Doesn't matter that they were admitting to all manner of crimes. Uh, I was the one facing the uh facing prison time so um <clears throat> i knew i had to get out of there and i escaped i escaped uh from two fbi surveillance teams uh and i made my way to uh moscow russia so why did you decide to go to russia well i went to russia because i knew that this is one place that the fbi was not going to be able to come and uh take me um you know, there are a lot of countries without extradition laws. For instance, the Maldives, they don't have any extradition agreement with the United States. Um, but that doesn't mean that they won't give you up to the United States if the U.S. comes asking. The U.S. has done that in the Maldives, and they've given up uh, citizens from other countries. So Russia is truly the one place that uh, I am safe from the reach of the U.S. government. Yeah. Well, uh <laughs> I ran across your interview with uh, this lady, Maria uh -huh. Lilianova. Lilianova, yeah, yeah. And uh, 
that I was kind of knocked out about it. And I immediately posted on Facebook. And mm -hmm. uh, I want to, you know, like actually read what I wrote on Facebook here. So I said, this is one of the best depictions of cognitive dissonance I have ever seen. What does it take for people to confront the stark reality that everything <laughs> they've been told is 180 degrees the opposite of the truth? It is not unlike realizing that you've been living in a cult your whole life and undergoing the process of being deprogrammed. Most people don't have what it takes to face, face it, let alone the means to pay for a therapist. Quote, we will know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false, unquote, said William J. Casey, CIA director and media mogul who was on the board and a major stockholder of Capital Cities that took over ABC in 1985. Facing the fact that he actually said that is more than many people can handle. But only a very small minority ever come to realize the horror that it has already come to fruition. Our country is in deep trouble. And yeah. uh, now that's the way I feel about it. I feel really because uh, yeah. I've been studying this for like 50 years and uh, it, it, it never ceases to blow my mind. Yeah, our country is incredibly deep trouble, incredibly deep trouble. The sad part about it is, you know, because of these crazy political agendas, they don't even realize it. And, um, you know, I'm 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 uh, on the fence politically. I'm I'm pretty neutral. I, I consider myself an independent. Uh, for instance, um, I'm an atheist who. Uh, believes in women's rights to choose to a certain point. Um, I was like the original Black Lives Matter guy. That's what I came forward in my department for in uh, 2000, um, uh, 2008 is when I came across a, a, a bunch of guys beating, beating blacks in my, uh, uh, in my community. And, uh, I went against that system to expose them and, um, you know, they might made my life a living hell for it. I have been labeled a, um, a BLM activist. I have been labeled a right wing conspiracist, a conspiracist or whatever it is, <clears throat> whatever, whatever people want to label me to fit their agenda, they do. But nobody wants to look at the real facts of what is taking place in our country right now. And it's and not only in our country, but around the world right now. And it's absolutely – well, first of all, it's shocking to me because Americans, to me, we are one of the most intelligent, freest thinkers. At least I used to believe that. And um, I still want to believe that, but I, I can't anymore because – the ignorance, the willful ignorance of fact is so powerful and so blatant that I I go to sleep wondering what in the hell is going to happen to my children uh, when they are older. And, uh, you know, it's for me, it's one of the scariest times in uh, in American history. Yeah. And uh, you brought up the willful ignorance. You know, and uh, so that kind of leads me into um, what Maria uh, was mm. going through, right? Yeah. Because, you know, she was a peace activist in Russia. And she was believing the Western propaganda, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it took her having to go there. And the thing is, that's, that's what I've been discovering. And that uh, if you want to actually find out what's actually true, you know, and anything that has anything to do with the other side of the U.S. border, right? Mm -hmm. And especially countries that have been targeted by the State Department, you know, you basically have to go there because, you know, what you're going to get from the media is 180 percent the opposite of the truth. You're 100 percent yeah. correct. It, it is uh, you will not receive any truth by the mainstream media. They are paid to lie. 
by the U.S. government. Uh, they are encouraged to lie, and they are fed um, lies and misinformation by the U.S. government that they are told to push, and they do. No questions asked. I don't know when this – I think this started becoming a big deal in the 70s, maybe, maybe the 60s. In fact, there is an interview uh, with a CIA agent who uh, went against the system. Um, I think it was in the 70s about how he was he was instructed to feed misinformation to the uh, mainstream media so they would be able to push their agendas and narratives. And the fact that people don't realize what's happening now, um, it can't be anything, anything other than will for ig ignorance so they can defend their positions. You know, I had uh, uh, Ben Norton on last week. He runs this uh, this outfit called Multipolarista. So he's an investig investigative journalist, you know, in Latin ah, America. Right. But he's been reporting on this, all this stuff that we're talking about, you know, and uh, and so the New York Times did a hit piece on him. Right. And they mm, called him a conspiracy surprising. theorist. Do you know why? <laughs> why? Because he said the Maidan was a coup. <laughs> yeah, but the Maidan was a coup. <laughs> yes. And the and New York fact, Times, the New York Times have, uh, reported on it back in 2014, right? It's crazy. It's crazy. So they're rewriting. It's a straight out of 1984. You know, it's a rewriting yeah. history. History. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so that's all stuff you're not supposed to know, <laughs> right? Yeah. But how they can just turn, just erase all this stuff, you know, and, uh, you know, you're not supposed to know what's going on in the Donbass. You know, you're not supposed <laughs> to know the Civil War started in 2014. Yeah. You're not, not supposed to know that, uh, you know, that they uh, have been gunning for this war. That's another thing, you know, is that uh, the part in the tape, you know, like where they're talking about interviewing that guy who was a high level official in uh, Donetsk, I think. Donetsk. But, uh, you know, yeah, he uh, was in uh, on all the, the negotiations. Uh, uh, you're talking about Vlad Dianego, the um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Lugansk People's Republic. Oh, uh, yeah. Is there, yeah. So is there a tape of that that I can watch? Uh, yeah. Uh, go to my channel, and um, it's literally interview with Vlad Dianego. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, that – that hit piece on me by the Daily Beast. Um, they said, well, the whole premise of the article is that I went to Ukraine to prove Putin's biolab uh, conspiracy theory. Right. And I was going to ask you about that. You know, well, uh, Victoria Nuland basically let the cat out of the bag, right? She, well, she, she had no that, choice. Yeah. Because um, now – I have done a lot of communications with people in Ukraine, and last year, way before Putin ever came forward with this uh, thing on biolabs, I was in touch with a lady who actually worked for the Ukrainian Department of Health, and she contacted me with a bunch of documents as a whistleblower, and – um, I did two videos about this. First, I did – how big pharma was experimenting on Ukrainian citizens. And the second one that I did was uh, all the US funded labs in uh, Ukraine. Um, and this was long before Putin ever mentioned any of this to the public. Uh, and I had actually published these documents on my website. Nobody paid attention back then. Uh, and so when you look at the dishonesty of this article, uh, it's because they basically – they lied about the timeline. They could make me seem like uh, I was some kind of conspiracy theorist, but – Well, that's what uh, they called you. Uh, let's take a look at this, uh, this interview now. It's a, Like mm -hmm. I say, it's one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. All right. I'm sitting here with the lovely Maria or Masha. Um she was my translator in the Donbass when I went the last time. Now, why was she my translator in the Donbass? Why did I specifically choose her? The reason I chose her is because she's a staunch liberal. She's an anti-war protester. Um, and she had a set of beliefs about this conflict that I did not believe to be true. And 
uh, everything that I told her, she did not believe to be true. Um, she thought everything that I was saying was Russian propaganda, and I thought everything that she was saying was um, Western propaganda. And so I kind of gave her a challenge to come and see for herself. And it was a, a very interesting trip. Um, so we're going to talk to uh, Maria, and we're going to get her impressions. And we will see the conclusion of uh, what took place. So now I should note that in the beginning of the trip, on our way down, we had several disagreements about um, what was really happening. And I said, you know what, we're going to meet my friend Thomas Roper. Thomas, uh, for you guys that don't know, Thomas, he's a very prolific, uh, uh, prolific uh, geopolitical uh, writer. He's written seven books. He's a incredible. He's an incredible journalist, uh, and he's been to the Donbass uh, just as many times as I have. And so, uh, he is much better at articulating than me. I thought that he would be able to uh, talk to Maria and maybe see her uh, to 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 kind of put some uh, reason. Not, not, not reason, but, uh, you know, maybe try to kind of help her with her thoughts. Because really, she was struggling a lot. Well, the normal impression of the, the Russian guys and, and girls and whatever um, who are influenced by what I call Russian um, the Western propaganda. Because um, uh, there were many, many emotions and, and not really many arguments. So she was just uh, emotionally telling what she's feeling. And when I tried to um, explain things, it was it didn't really come through. Um, this is a normal way, which I see very often in Russia, and also on, with Western people. That's normal because that's the Western how it's, the Western propaganda works. They they are just pushing on the emotions, and when you are emotional, you are not able um, for for a real um, fact fact based argumentation. So um, at the end of the day, somehow I just just told her, okay, well, I see uh, you will see it in Donbass yourself. This was, well, I, I, on some points, maybe I, I, I was able to make her think, but I wasn't really able to convince her. So um, the conversation ended somehow with the words that I said, really, okay, you go and we talk afterwards. Um, but that's the problem really, uh, that, that the Western propaganda is emotional. So, um, and you know this yourself. When you're afraid, when you are hating somebody, when you love somebody, you're not ready for emotions. If um, we know this from from many stories, just in private life, um, when somebody is betraying you, but you love the person, you are not able to listen to arguments. And that's that's how emotions work, and that's how the Western propaganda works. They so show emotional pictures, uh, tell emotional stories, and this switches off the analytic uh, thinking. And that's what's happening, and and she was an example for that. Um, so I wasn't really able to convince her, absolutely not somehow. But uh, I ended the conversation with, you're a good girl, and we talk when you come back. Okay, John, let's start from the beginning. All right. Just as a, as a, as a, as a background information, if you will. Because it's not only true for myself, mm -hmm. it's true for millions of people in Russia okay. who are horrified by this war. We all have ties with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Either it's blood ties because it's family members or it's friends or it's both. It's inseparable. Mm -hmm. We are the same people. Probably if someone from Ukraine heard that now, they would be uh, denying that as a as, uh, vehemently as they could, but we are the same people, mm -hmm. actually. We grew up on the same movies, on the same music, on the same literature. Mm -hmm. We like the same food. We are. We have the same cultural references. We truly are as close as nations as it can only possibly be. Okay. The war with Ukraine mm -hmm. is the most horrific thing that could possibly happen. Mm -hmm. I honestly do not have a vocabulary to describe that because it just shouldn't exist. So those words don't exist in my language or in English language or mm -hmm. in any language, I believe, because it's just beyond horrors. 
to imagine that we could go with war to Ukraine. From, as we say in Russian, every iron, every day, we hear how this war, how this horrors, how this aggression is unmotivated, mm -hmm. how Russia went insane, how Ukraine is suffering, how it's absolutely undeserved, unprovoked, unreasonable, and how there is no forgiveness to anyone who is Russian, how we all, 150 millions of us, supported, um, what horrible people we are, all of that. Well, you know. Yeah, of course. I, I think every, everybody knows that. I don't have exact numbers, I don't think anyone has, but according to different evaluations from like, and they vary from 200,000 to 2 million people fled Russia mm -hmm. since the beginning of the war. And I refuse to call it special operation. It is war. Okay. You know, they fled Russia just like Ukrainians flee Ukraine because they only, f they flee because they cannot stay here anymore. They suffocate here. They see that's on cars, on billboards, mm -hmm. on even on socks, for God's sake, on everything. And it honestly makes you feel like you, you have no air. You cannot see this. Okay. You cannot see this. You, it's, it's unbearable physically. When it started, I fled <laughs> to the Far East. Mm -hmm to work in a rehab center mm -hmm. because it would mean that I would stay within that rehab center and they wouldn't go out and I wouldn't be exposed to this sets. Mm -hmm. And that was the only way to survive it, basically. Because I, I don't know, I, it's like you feel like you need to walk out of the window because <laughs> you, you cannot live through that. This is what is done to the people of Russia by the media, by the news by this continuous narrative mm -hmm. that we are, I can say the bad guy, but it doesn't cover it. It's, I don't know, 1% of what we are right. <laughs> in the eyes of the world. That's what it is. Yeah. So this, is, this was the beginning for me. Um, Sometime in April, I believe it was, you sent me the subtitles to translate mm -hmm. from several interviews that you took in Mariupol. That's okay. right. And, uh, and I was listening to what people were saying, trying to make sense of it, trying to convey what they were saying the best way possible. Mm -hmm. And it was very much like I was listening to the Russian side of the propaganda. It made me feel like, wait a second, that doesn't match. And they could not be the propaganda people because they are just simple people on the streets. They're not actors. It's obvious that they're not actors. Mm. And it was a very serious clash in my head. Uh, later on, it's sometime in the beginning of July, I believe it was, um, a friend of mine asked me to help him to get his brother, who was from Valnavaha, that's mm -hmm. a town between Mariupol and Donetsk, mm -hmm. uh, to get this person outside of Russia because the, he managed to leave Ukraine, mm -hmm. leave Donbass through... Uh, through the Crimea, mm -hmm. uh, to get him out to Germany. So we worked out the route for that person. Mm -hmm. And of course we met in Moscow and they talked to that guy as well. Mm -hmm. And again, there was another first-hand evidence and another clash. So I had to have my answers because what I was sure the truth was, mm -hmm. as I refused to believe anything that Russia was saying, any Russian, it was all like, oh no, it's all Russian propaganda, it's all lies. I tended to believe what the West is saying. Mm -hmm. Those were my sources. And what I received from these interviews that you sent to translate and mm -hmm. from this guy was saying was an absolute 
contrast to what I was receiving mm -hmm. from all other sources. So when you said that you're going and you need a translator, I said, well, you of course can have a choice, but pick me. I'm a yeah. good translator. That's that you are. Well, so I was in a, in a situation when I knew that I cannot go on anymore without having my questions answered. I had to know. Mm -hmm. And Thomas asked me like, hey, it's they are bombing there in Donetsk. Uh, they have these mines, these butterflies mm -hmm. laying around. It's dangerous. Aren't you afraid to go there? I'm like, Thomas, I don't care. I have to know because not knowing is worse. Because not knowing is guaranteed doubts and frustrations and fears and shame. I mean, it's an incredible guilt that we all are feeling. It's a shame. It's like you are ashamed of who you are just because it is your passport. Mm -hmm. Just because you are born in this country and this is your citizenship and you're supposed to feel guilty and ashamed for that. Mm -hmm. It's unbearable. I had to go. Yeah. So I'm very thankful to you that you made it happen. <clears throat> well, and on our way, on our way almost to the border, uh, the hotel where we had rooms reserved, um, it got bombed. It did. And um, on one of your, um, I guess, pro-Ukrainian channel, would you call it that? Uh, let's say anti-Russian channel. Okay, on one of your anti-Russian channels, uh, somebody posted a video about how basically it was a fake and they were using actors to show... Yeah, how, the, how they were using actors to show that there are dead bodies there, that they're actually not dead bodies, but they are actors and bad actors as they are uh, playing the dead bodies and moving. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, uh, so one of the first things that we kind of encountered, I guess, was I had to run, we were running around uh, looking for a microphone cable and we went into a shop and there was a woman who was quite distraught. Yeah, we went to that market because uh, it's like electronic market mm -hmm. where if you need to find anything, that's the only place in Donetsk where you can have hopes to find it. Right. And we asked around for that cable. And as it always goes, people get interested uh, because we have a foreigner, so everybody everybody gets involved into a conversation. And there was this girl who was really upset, and she was going through a serious through serious personal issues as well. And she saw me as some sort of a um, counselor, I guess, of some something like that. Mm -hmm. So she shared, and we talked a lot. And she said, "I just lost." Um, person, uh, a friend, uh, apparently she had a friend who walked by that hotel when, when, uh, that, when it was bombed and that person died and the three-year-old daughter of that person died as well. Yeah. Maybe, maybe on this video there was exactly the body of that person. The video was filmed from the inside of the hotel. So like it's, a surveillance camera. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I'm not an expert. I, I, I wouldn't be able to tell. Um, and we, I asked about it and I was told by those who deal with it every day that it is normal for, for, as they say, fresh corpse to sometimes move. Sure. Absolutely. It happens. And apparently this is what, what, what caught, what was caught on the camera in this video. Yeah. But the cynicism of that, like, Hey, see, that's an actor when somebody lost life. Mm -hmm. it's it's insane yeah so so let's talk about when we actually got into the donbass when we got to um donetsk in lugansk what was the first thing that actually struck you okay we it took us a very long time to cross the border mm -hmm. so we uh, and uh, the hotel was bombed and uh we didn't have a place to stay and mm -hmm. it was already relatively late in the evening. So uh, John called his friend, another journalist, Graham Phillips, who lives in Lugansk currently. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, he was uh, a wonderful host. He said, come over to Lugansk and stay, instead of Donetsk, go to Lugansk and mm. stay there. So our first couple of days were actually in Lugansk. He hosted us, which was really super kind of him. Graham, if you watch this, thank you so much. You're wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> so anyway, what I'm trying to say is that we arrived to Lugansk and uh, it everything is covered with those Zs. Mm -hmm. Every vehicle, every bus stop, every uh, basically every surface. Everyone wears chevrons with Zs. All of it. Mm -hmm. Please understand. This is the, in my head, this is the new swastika. This is the sign that Russia is turning into a fascist Germany. And then we go to Donbass that we are, according to the news, destroying. Mm -hmm. Yes. And everything there is covered with Zs. How can that possibly be? If people hate us so much, if we are such an enemy, if we are such a, will, such a villain, that if we are such a monster that everything there is covered with the symbol and the symbol gets complete support. That would be like the Jews wearing, voluntarily walking around with a Nazi symbol on their... Sort of. With a swastika. Sort of. It makes no sense. It's, it, it did make no sense. I was like, what is that? Next day, uh, we had a, uh, we went to Severodonetsk. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it is the city which is in a similar condition as Mariupol in terms of devastation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's horrible. Yet, uh, I mean, they have no water, no electricity, no, no nothing. Yet there are people who stayed there, who live there in basements. Mm -hmm. We went to one yard and uh, there is a children's playground mm -hmm. and graves right on this play playground, right there. Mm -hmm. It was the, the first biggest shock that I had when I when I looked at it live, when it's not a photo or, I don't know, some video that you watch on TV, but when you see it live, this playground and those graves right there. And there are people there and they talk to them a little bit and not a single one of them expressed any kind of negativity towards Russia. All the negativity was aimed at Ukraine. Mm -hmm. That was another clash in information which was crucial to me. Like, how come you're not tearing me apart? I am Russian. <laughs> it is my people who did that to you and in my head. Mm -hmm. And the answer was, no, 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 no. It's not this way. And then this conversation is repeated in Mariupol, in Lugansk, in Donetsk, in Volnavaha. They repeated all, in all the places where we went to. So it was it was kind of extreme red pilling, if you will, for me to accept that. Um, on the second day, because I would say it's second day, we had a meeting with uh, Vlad Denega, mm -hmm. the guy who is currently a Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lugansk People's Republic. Mm -hmm. He was responsible for the negotiations in Minsk that lasted during all this almost eight years. He was there on every meeting. Mm -hmm. And John was kind enough to say like, hey, what would be your questions to that guy? So the questions that were asked to this guy were my questions. They might seem naive because they are of a person who has no clue. I had no clue. And it's, it's true. I, I really didn't know. I wasn't following that much. My um, attitude to that was like during all these eight years that preceded it from 2014, my attitude was like, this is internal Ukrainian business. Russia has nothing to do with it. Ukraine should resolve it themselves. Let them resolve it themselves. And I didn't look deep into that. It was like their business. I don't, I let them be. Mm -hmm. I am very much not proud of that now. I should have paid attention. I should have paid more attention. 
So this person, Vlad Denego, he was explaining from the start, because my first question was, how come that the people of Donbass are hated so much mm -hmm. that they are being physically destroyed, basically, during mm -hmm. all these eight years? Why are they hated so much? And it's a two-hour interview of explanation of what was happening. Yeah. how it came up to be, how it reached this point. He really went in depth. He was amazing. Um, and I will just kind of note on a side note, for me, you know, I, I know what answers I want to hear. Um, but the most important for me is to show the other side, um, show, show the other side what's actually happening. And if I use my mindset that's not going to help anything. So I wanted to make sure that she asked her questions because she has the mindset that a lot of other uh, liberal anti-war protesters have. And so for me, this is very important to kind of reach across the aisle and try to answer these questions, to try to um, take away some of these um, uh, myths, I guess, that are being said. So... Okay, so go ahead. So anyway, I received this explanation and the story and the, 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 whole, the whole story of how it developed and how what started on, in February was basically unavoidable. Mm -hmm. It would have started anyway sooner or later. Mm -hmm. That truly was no other way in that situation. Yeah. Which is crazy, but I had to accept it because it it really was something unavoidable. Yeah. My question for the reasons for hate to everything that is to, to the people of Donbass and now to everything that is Russian remains though. And I got that question answered from another interview that we had um, a few days later. Uh with uh, the guy who is uh, a counselor, an advisor to the head of the Donetsk People's Republic. Mm -hmm. His name is Jan Gagin, and he is a high rank military official, a very knowledgeable person, mm -hmm. a very smart guy. You know, he, uh, he helped us a lot. We went together to Mariupol to deliver humanitarian help, and in one of this, in, 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 during this trip, uh, he went to a school and uh, found a bunch of books there in the school library and brought those books and showed those books to us. And this interview was about these findings. Mm -hmm. And uh, these books are aimed at children from school children for, from like probably seven years old till the time they finish school. So they are different levels, mm -hmm. starting from just books with pictures because little children they think in images they don't really read much but they remember pictures to history books to all kind of analytical books so it's it's that literature that is needed for the education and it, it is clear that from the early age it gets put into the brains of children how we are enemies with Ukraine mm -hmm. That we are not brother nations like Russians think, that we have zero uh, common cultural background that doesn't exist, that uh, we are enemies, that we should be hated, that we are basically de being dehumanized in their eyes from the early age on. Imagine seeing that for someone who went to school and uh, went and learned there that, well, there was Kiev Rus, Kievska Rus, the Kiev Russia, that Kiev is the mother of all Russian cities. There is a stone in Kiev with engraving on it from here the Russian land began. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you, you see the other side, what is taught to the kids in the Ukraine. And I still ask why, why, why all these lies? 
why all this hatred being indoctrinated? And this is the reason why the, there are people in Ukraine. I, I know not all of them. I'm absolutely sure, just like there are different Russians, there are different Ukrainians, not all of them, but truly there are people of Ukraine who support and have supported these bombings of Donbass, this elimination of the population there mm -hmm. during all these years. Mm -hmm. That was the answer why that happened. Yeah. Um, all right, so we went to uh, Valhalla, to the hospital. Valhalla. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so we went there. We went to the hospital. Um, we met the doctors. And uh, how did you feel about that trip? In Valnavaja, they held 600 people in basements. They held them hostages. They didn't let them go. Who? The Ukrainian troops. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm turning into these people. I just say they. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Ukrainian troops were holding them hostages in the basements of the hospital. Mm -hmm. There were patients, there were wounded people, there were civilians they could catch and put there, there were um, medical personnel, everyone. Mm -hmm. They spent months in the basement. Mm -hmm. We walked around um, some areas of this basement saw where they slept, where they ate, how they lived there. And they are like, it's impossible conditions. At the same time, the Ukrainian troops found the storage of drugs in the hospital, broke into the safe and got themselves high on those wonderful cocktail of uh, adrenaline and, and uh, opium, which makes you fearless, which makes you really high, which makes you do crazy things and not care. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's fun. So they were, they were running around, shooting at everywhere through the, well, it's just insane. It's like human hunting or something. I imagine it's just crazy. They did, you know, it's that kind of thing. And uh, at a certain point when they were retreating because uh, they were running away from the from the Russians and the Donetsk, so the Allied forces. Mm -hmm. They decided to destroy the evidence of that whole thing and they wanted, and they shot from the tank. There was direct shot from, from, from the tank that was there. Uh, and we saw the hole in the wall that this shot left to make sure that the building collapses over the people who were in the basement, civilians children. They had six children born during this month in this basement. Mm -hmm. Like newly born children. All of them. Just to be dead. Just to die under the room, under the what remains of the building after mm -hmm. you shoot at it from a tank. What's the reason to destroy a hospital? It's a hospital. They know exactly that it's a hospital. They received medical help from those doctors even though they were Ukrainians. Yeah. Uh, one of the very interesting things that I heard while we were there is that one of the injured people was a native English speaker. So either American or Canadian or British. And he was injured, not mortally, but to the point where he couldn't evacuate with the rest of the Ukrainians. So uh, they shot him in the back of the head. Yeah, not not to deal with uh, dragging of the wounded or something. Just they said that there were several bodies and their faces were disfigured. Their fingerprints were removed so that they wouldn't be recognized. Yeah. So they were removing the evidence this way. Just shot them dead. It's wild. Yeah. Wild. Um. Yeah. So, so that was the hospital. Uh, what 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 else uh, what else did you uh, on the on the last day we went to the front line to the city to the town called Svitagorsk mm -hmm. and uh, this is where they have active fighting this is where 
from about 4,500 people, about 1,500 people still remain. Mm -hmm. They hide in in basements and somewhere and in churches. Uh, there, there is a big church there where people hide as well. And uh, they are terrified there. Apparently, two days before, mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a group of journalists mm -hmm. who filmed them and put it online, and it all went to the Ukrainian TV as well. So people were recognized, and these people have relatives in Ukrainian towns. Kharkov was named for sure among these towns. Mm -hmm. And now these relatives of these people are hunted, and they say that they're like number ones to be killed. Mm -hmm. So these people are terrified not only because they are the targets for snipers, mm -hmm. not only because they fear for their own lives, but because they also fear and maybe even more for the lives of their relatives, for their families who are in Ukraine. Yeah. Which to me is just, it's just beyond comprehension. Yeah. Um, so uh, me and um, Nikita from, uh, well, you guys have seen Nikita in my past videos from Buhanka Project and Masha um, and uh, a priest, uh, Father Andre and a nurse, Tatiana, uh, we all went uh, to this town. And when we got there, they said, you can't leave your vehicles out in the open because it could get bombed by drones or you can be shot by snipers. So we had to rush in with our vehicles filled with food, put them into a garage to unload everything and then rush them back out. And, uh, you know, I have to say to Maria's, to Maria's credit here, she is rock solid. We were walking down these streets where snipers were 200 meters away um on the other side of the river now granted it, it we wouldn't have been an easy shot because there are destroyed buildings in the way but still the the risk was very high and uh you know she's walking along in her vest kind of taking in everything uh she was absolutely amazing you know when i began the trip i told her i will only take you if you uh, are objective and you keep an open mind and that she did a hundred percent um and what was your feeling on seeing that town i mean you the bombing was going on uh not far from us you could see all the smoke rising um what was your feeling it has to stop it somehow has to stop I don't know what should happen for this to be over, but it should not exist like this. That's true. If I could take all these people and get them out of there, mm -hmm. I would. If I could have some sort of a magic coverage to just cover them away so they're not visible and they are not, uh, and it is not possible to harm them through that coverage, I'd use it. Mm -hmm you really feel very helpless. Even though you bring help, humanitarian help, you bring all this food, you, 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 you try to do something, but you still feel so helpless against this crime. Yeah. So how do you feel? You feel like you do what you can. And you also constantly understand that it is so little. And you know that you have to go back. Because being elsewhere makes no sense at all. You have to go back. Yeah. And do the do what you can. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, not to insert a shameless plug here, but if you guys want to donate to the people, uh, we are going to be making more humanitarian trips. You can send to my PayPal. I will get the bunny here where you can send Bitcoin. The link is in the description below. Um, but, you know, we... Uh, on limited funds, we did a lot of stuff. 
we 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 got a lot done. I mean, yeah, we, we, did. Uh, we spent all we had. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally uh, all uh, we had. Unfortunately, I... yeah. So on on the last on the on the way back, we had to we had to sleep in a car. We didn't have money for the hotel. We <laughs> just yeah. spent it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that wasn't good. But um, you know, e even as far west as Svetogorsk was, you know, it was interesting because the people said, uh, "We do not want to talk to you on camera. Do not film our faces." But when we are liberated, that was very specific. When we are liberated by Russia and we are safe, then we will speak to you all that that you want. They are. They want. They want the world to know only when it's safe for them. Yeah. Right now, they don't believe it's safe for them, and they are scared scared to death for their families. Yeah, but they want their independence. Have, did you notice this? They want, they they don't want to be a part of a country that hates they, them so much. They don't want to be part of Ukraine for sure. So, um, on our way back, uh, another thing that she has read on a bunch of her anti-Russian channels, um, the fact that refugees are treated so incredibly bad by the Russians. So, I decided to stop at a refugee center and uh we we called we got the director uh we only gave them what 20 minutes notice even less we gave them 20 minutes notice so it's not like they could like clean and make everything orderly we gave them 20 minutes notice so uh what was your opinion of uh going to see that um uh, that refugee center Did well it's like a pretty decent hotel basically yeah it's really nice it's clean it's very well thought through mm -hmm. they have great canteen with really great food uh, i mean they eat better than i do uh, yeah i know <laughs> they, right? really, they really have great food canteen is a cafeteria for yeah it's, it's called canteen you know, yeah. or you can say it's a restaurant basically yeah it, it it's simple but in terms of food quality it's a restaurant yeah yeah because that's for sure and uh, they live there for as long as they need mm -hmm. there is no pressure or any time frame within which they need to move out so mm -hmm. they can stay for as long as they need it's free Food is free. They have a way to find work. Some people that I talked to have already found jobs, so they can make a living. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the women I talked to came with her son, mm -hmm. and she already arranged it, uh, arranged everything. So on the first of September, her son will go to school in Varonish. Mm -hmm. It's all possible. It's all provided, mm -hmm. and uh, they live. They went there voluntarily. Mm -hmm. They explained to me how it works because in the Western media it is said that we, we uh, evil Russians, uh, grab them, put them in buses and just bring them to Russia for... Labor camps. Labor camps. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh yeah, like that. we eat them alive, we take their organs, we take away their passports, all that stuff. Yeah. I mean... You don't stop at anything when it comes to that, to those lies. Mm -hmm. The wor the worse there is, the better. Uh, so it's like you you put whatever there. It will be accepted, of course, because that's us, the evil Russians. That's mm -hmm. what we do, right? <laughs> so it's a it's a, it's a, it's a really nice place. They are in really good conditions. They can do whatever they want, they can leave at any moment if they want, or they can stay for as long as they want, if they want, mm -hmm. and it's free of charge. When they, their only job was to get to the border. At the border, they had, uh, there were buses from different towns, because they were, uh, the woman I talked to said that they had eight towns to choose mm -hmm. where they want to go in Russia, and she chose Voronezh. Mm -hmm. But there were eight towns to choose, and they were, brought there. Mm -hmm. That's how it went. There was one woman from Kharkov who constantly asked, uh, when are you going to take my passport away from me? Like, why would we take away your passport away from you? <laughs> why? Why? Like, because I heard that you take away passports and you then force people to work and, and don't give them passports back so that they would be motivated to work for free or something like that. I mean, 
crazy. But this is what you hear in the this Western media. This is what's in the media, yes. So, you as somebody who saw everything reported in the media, believed everything that was reported in the Western media, and was quite anti-Russian at the very beginning very of this. Very anti-Russian. Very anti-Russian at the beginning of this. How much of what you now know that you read, uh, how much of what you read that you now know is not true? All of it. All of it. The proportion of those lies, mm -hmm. the scale of that is is very much comparable with the scale of the horror of this war. Mm -hmm. It is that much. The cynicism of that is incomprehensible. It's just insane. There is zero word of truth in that. I thought, okay, maybe, okay, maybe there are exaggerations. And, you know, the truth is the first victim at the war. I mean, it's a famous phrase. But maybe at least half of it is true. Yeah. Uh, nothing of it is true. Nothing. No, so sad. it was a sweet red pill to know that my country is actually not a villain and I don't have to say that country yeah. about my country because it is my country and what it's doing is explainable. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much. I am absolutely sure that this interview is going to open a lot of eyes uh, just because of your background. And uh, we'll see where we were at the beginning of this adventure and where we are now at the end of this adventure. It's quite a transformation actually yes. to see. Uh, and I watched, I watched her transform during this whole trip and it was really amazing. It was quite, it was amazing. It is an absolute eye opening and I know that I will go back. Yeah. Well, Somehow I will go back. Yes, we will go back because I need a great translator. By the way, she is Hands down, the best translator I have ever met in my entire life. Um, her words are absolutely fluid. I've never seen anything like it in my life. So, absolutely brilliant. If anybody needs a translator, well, you guys need to reach out for her. So, anyways, John Mark Dugan. And uh, we hope that uh, you found this interview enlightening. <laughs>